introduce yourself and tell us what we're doing here. Okay. Do I? How do I introduce? Just name for just, my introduction. Just introduce yourself and tell us what we're doing here. <laughs> My name is Max El Haj. What we're about to watch is Travis Mayer demoing the first training day of our new training cycle from the Elite Path in GGT Compete. Our program has four main paths. We have Elite, RX, Intermediate, and then a Master's Path that you can follow. This is day one, week now one. Now you gotta be more fired up than that. Yeah, how are you gonna come into day one all like chill like that, huh? <laughs> The first thing Travis did was part of the strength work that Mike McGoldrick wrote. It's just, just pace yourself. I mean, run at your own pace. Don't worry about everyone else around you. You know, I mean, of course, go all out. You know, you leave it here on the field, but you know, just, just do what you're good at. Four different components. I got my phone here. I'm going to read them off to you. Part one is a, a six minute alternating EMOM. In minute one, he's going to do three seated vertical jumps. And in minute two, he's gonna do three seated med ball chests. Oh, he's doing se <laughs> three seated med ball chest throws. Don't make me do it again. <laughs> so I like writing in these EMOMs before going into some Olympic lifts. And you'll see that consistently this cycle, just as like a good primer, getting used to like, hey, like this is a strength session. You need to get your nervous system, your cervical system, <laughs> your nervous system <laughs> ramped up. And we're just gonna do that with two different variations of movements. And throughout the cycle, you'll just see different styles of plyometrics that I like to throw in. White boys got ups, you know what I'm saying? And it's a good way to know if maybe you are overtrained. Like if it's really hard to even warm up through that, that maybe is a time for you to back off. Obviously the day, day one, yep. you're not gonna need to, right? But as we go through this, if you're like going through the, the plyometric EMOMs, you're like, I have no speed or power today. That's a good telltale sign to back off. Or if you feel really good, make sure you ramp yourself up so that you can crush your strength uh, numbers. I mean, I think not skipping the things that look simple and easy um, from the box jumps or seated box jumps to the med ball throws, because I know all the little details matter. And I think that is something that I've worked very hard on from the beginning of my career to now of not missing out on those opportunities to get better, whether that is something not as exciting or as glamorous, but something I know that's gonna keep me healthy for a longer period of time and be able to compete at the highest level. So don't skip out on all the little things, even if it doesn't seem exciting, it's worth it. Don't use too bouncy of a ball. It'll nail you in the face. I've done that before. I have no. to. Yeah. Bam, hit me right in the face. <laughs> Busted my lip wide Were open. Were there people in there? Yeah. I, I wish I could have seen that. Uh, real quick on this, I think intent is very important. Yeah. So some people see this and like, it's just a little warm up. So I'm just going to kind of jump and then I'm just going to throw really focus in. And maybe like the first minute is like 90% effort. The second minute is 95%. And then that, that third yeah. rotation through the six minutes is max effort. Like really have some like true intention to be as explosive as possible. And if you're like a, a shouter, like a, yeah, it. yeah it's a Do good, it. it's a good opportunity to yeah. warm up vocal cords there. Exactly. <laughs> All right. The next piece was 10 complexes of power snatch, hang squat snatch, squat snatch. The loads here are gonna range from 115 to 135 pounds, and he's gonna rest 60 to 90 seconds between his sets. You don't want to treat it like it's a one at max because then you're over bracing and you're wasting energy, but you also need the right amount of tension to move the bar efficiently. So you have to find that middle ground. I tell people to really pay attention to that. Either when you're at the top, get your re-breath, or on the way down, when you're basically bringing the bar down, you have an opportunity to kind of get that breath of air in so you can kind of reset and hold tension going into the next rep. Keep it to where your positions are still good. Don't try to go up and wait just because you want to because you're trying to snatch heavy. That's not the point and focus of that session where keeping it lighter, focusing on your breathing mechanics as cycling a barbell, catching in a tight position in the bottom. I think all those little things of when you're doing it, practicing make a big difference on game day when you are trying to compete or race somebody. That's when it's really gonna matter. The next component that we have here is hang power cleans. One rep every 20 seconds at 75 to 80% of the 1RM for 30 total reps. The, this last season especially, we saw less true 1RM testing mm -hmm. in the qualifier stages leading up to the games. We saw some at the games, obviously, with the max snatch and clean and jerk, but 
for everyone else that's doing these stages, a lot of it was under fatigue. So yeah. you've got to get used to that. And I think that we continue to add that in. And like the Wednesday session of this week, you see something similar as well in a snatch format that's more AMRAP percentage based. So hang power cleans, the thing I went off of was not my true one rep max. I think when you see these percentages, most people are like, oh, that was my best number that I hit five years ago, right? Don't necessarily take that from what you've hit five years ago. For me, I probably try to look at within the last six months to a year of something I know I'm comfortable gonna hit with good positions and not get sloppy with it. So I try to base it off of a number that I know I'm gonna catch in a good position. I know it's not sloppy and ugly and that when I do go to that percentage of work that I'm actually refining the skill and getting better and putting a good intention forward for that. So don't get carried away with your true one rep max from four years ago. Focus on what you can hit now and then strive to get better from that. Moving on to back squats. The rep scheme here was 10, 8, 6, 4 with the loads being 60, 70, 75 and 80% of the 1RM. I always say go like five to 10 pounds under what you think you can hit. That way you're being extremely successful that first week of these progressions. And then each week, it's always better to know, all right, I hit them all with flying colors versus getting two weeks in and you're already failing, which should not be the case in yeah. a strength cycle. I will say we had a bunch of people hit PRs on their squats last cycle. So if you're refreshing your percentages and you're up by 10 or 15 pounds, just be aware that this cycle is going to be a little bit more challenging, right? Like because you crushed the last one, now you added load, and just like anybody that's done this in a different you know strength cycle, where you all of a sudden you reset your one RM, the next cycle is a little bit more challenging. Yeah. For the back squats, my focus is just trying to be the best I can right there. So I'm fully focused on keeping a good position. If I feel kind of sluggish and fatigued, drop the percentage just a tad. But if not, I'm really trying to go for it and not really be too scared of like, okay, well, I'm gonna save my energy because I know I have this workout after it. Have you ever done that? Were you, have you ever been that? Yeah, I mean, I think subconsciously, you naturally do it. Like you look, you see like, okay, I got a 20 minute, pretty hard Metcon with some headly deadlifting, a bunch of pull-ups, a bunch of muscle-ups, ring muscle-ups, and if you're not as confident in those movements, you're gonna save energy on the back squat. Like, okay, maybe I'll do 15% less on each of these. Well, that's a big difference. Um, so I think you just have to focus on the one part stay focused there when that's done, then address the workout. The final component of the strength work for the day was some accessory work. It is every three minutes times three sets, we're moving from 10 reverse tibialis raises, eight one and a quarter KOT split squats per side unloaded, and then six band assisted GH raises with a five to eight second very slow eccentric through that range of motion. I'm overloading the eccentric on this today a little bit because again, it's about restoring balance at the knee. We did a lot of squatting in this session, so the quads are super stiff and tight. I want to make sure we're focusing on the hamstrings equally and making sure that we're maintaining good balance at the knee when doing this exercise. If you're Chris, you don't have to use a band though. How many can you do unbroken right now, Chris? This is he's talking about Nordics, which is I know, even harder. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. but he yeah, he could do 20 then, right? Yeah. 15. 15 unbroken. Probably could on do the Nordic. Seven. Probably could do 17. Unassisted Nordics. <laughs> he's a beast. Nice. I've seen him do it. Can you do it with your arms overhead yet? I probably could. Mm. You've done it with a weight vest though, right? So you've had like a 20 pound weight vest. Super impressive. That's crazy. Now in the session, we're moving into the more CrossFit specific stuff. This training session was written by TTT coach Brandon Dorman, and it is in interval structure. It is three five minute intervals with a five minute rest in between. The first interval is 25 or 20 calories on the rower, 25 deadlifts at 225 or 155, 25 chest to bar pull-ups, and then in the remaining time to five minutes, AMRAP rope climbs in the remaining time. So this interval structure is three AMRAPs, all following that same format, except we increase the weight of the deadlift while we decrease the reps, and we increase the complexity of the gymnastics while we decrease the reps, and they all end with that AMRAP rope climbs at the end of the interval. On Mondays of this training cycle, one of the things that we looked at, we, we sat down after the games, we kind of reviewed the entire year. Where, where are those 
big limitations. Where were the biggest separators in the season? And quarterfinal test five was one of those. Like, yep. unless you were really good at rope climbs and had really good hinge endurance, you kind of got just left behind there. Like people were flying yeah. through that workout and then still crushing the nine rope climbs at the end. And other people that were really high level athletes or athletes that assumed that they would be okay on the rope climbs, either got crushed in the deadlifts or the other gymnastics work or got to the rope climbs fast and then just got completely crushed. Like it was a huge separator. These intervals on day one are the start of an eight week progression to retest quarterfinal test five. And for all of those that did it, you know how hard the rope climbs were at the end of that test five. So we're gonna make sure that we're doing dense rope climb sessions every single week to prepare you for the fatigue that you'll feel when you retest that. But it's also important to note that we don't just want to over fatigue you into rope climbs. We wanna make sure that you're doing skill work as well. So as we do this session on a Monday, another day in the week, you're gonna be doing skill work for your rope climbs and and for other variations of the gymnastics movements, so you're getting better at both the skill and the endurance of all of those gymnastics pieces. There's a huge temptation to do the same volume as the elite level athlete, but the reality is if you really wanna get better, we wanna make sure that you're doing the right volume for you so that you can have the right intent and the right intensity on each piece. So we have set it up based on all of the data and the level of athlete that's in our program to make sure that you're doing the right volume in each of those training paths. Mia is one of the best TTT coaches, in my opinion, to teach intermediate athletes how to develop. Mia is very good at creating step-by-step -step and progressive models to go from very far away to elite skills all the way up that mountain to be able to attain them. And not only did she attain them, but she was able to be at the CrossFit Games on a team with those high-level skills on display. So I trust her. If you're an intermediate athlete, you should too. Oh. Get out of here. I don't want to say nice you things while you're about? here. There's a plate here. <laughs> <laughs> your ass up and you Came in and shit on me. What happens in the intermediate path on most days is the gymnastics get pulled out of the conditioning. The reason for that is we are working on gymnastics separately in two categories, either got none, which means you don't have the gymnastics movement and you're working on developing it, or got some, which means you can do the movement, but you're not proficient enough or you don't have the volume tolerance to do it well under fatigue in a Metcon like this. So we t pull it out of the Metcon and work on building the endurance of it separately. And that'll show up on a different day this week. For the deadlift weight, that changes compared to the elite path because we are prepping for the open versus the elite path is prepping for quarterfinals or semifinals or the games, depending on what level they are. But we try to mirror our weights and Metcons to look like what you would see in an open workout because that's what we want to peak for and do as well as we can in, in order to either improve our open ranking from last year or try to make it into quarterfinals this year. All right, so here's what to expect on the workout. I think for the row, treat it as probably like a 1K to 2K pace where you're trying to just settle in. You're still pulling pretty hard, but you're not selling your soul because you still have a lot after that. When you get to the deadlifts, I always try to think of quick breaks, whether that's, and then I follow my hands straight down to just start picking up the bar or count three, two, one in your head and follow straight down. I think forcing yourself into a pattern or whatever kind of works for you, whether that's counting down or just I put my hands on the bar a certain way, finding something that works for you to get back to the bar quicker will allow you to make up time because the five minutes isn't very long. Chest to bar, if you're efficient, you can go unbroken or just one quick break. It's not necessary to go unbroken um, because more of the time, of course, is gonna be made up on the actual rope climb. So you're trying to save the grip as much as you can, but still get there as quickly as possible. On the rope climb, simple things. Get a good clamp. If you haven't done it, practice sitting on a box, practice sitting to standing a few times, just really get the clamp dialed in so then when you get into the workout, you're not even hesitating, you're not thinking about it, you're literally just getting the clamp going straight up. Um, play with your descent. I think a lot of those little details of coming down the rope faster will allow you to get more reps. Um, I always try to pick a number for myself personally before I ever grab chalk. So before I go into the workout, I knew there was some pulling before. So every like three to five reps, that's when I would allow myself to get chalk. You don't wanna to try to get chalk every time because that 20 to 30 seconds, every time you're chalking up your hands, really creeps into that five minute window. Um, 
as the weight is going heavier, the reps are going down, but I still think for the other two sets, breaking up the deadlifts, one set is completely fine, or one break, I mean. Um, for the bar muscle-ups, keep those same thing as the pull-ups, probably one quick break, then just run over to the rope, start going through it, or if you know the muscle-ups are gonna be an issue, break them up into three or four sets, whatever you can do, but try to make sure that the turnover speed is fast and the breaks are quick. Um, and then the final one is just kind of, I feel like you can almost hang on and go everything unbroken if you're efficient enough at those movements. If not, same concept, still try to think of breaking it up and be smart on the clamp, the rope climb. Yeah, for the eight weeks, I think stick with it. Trust the process. There is a plan and reason behind everything that you are doing. Some days, yeah, you're not gonna feel 100%, and you know what, that's okay. I don't personally either. Alexis doesn't. All of us go through those days and times where you're not firing on all cylinders and you're not gonna be feeling the best ever, but that's okay. We all go through it, we all experience it. So I think trusting the process, the eight weeks is not that long, but it's also, you're gonna see a lot of benefits at the end of the eight weeks. And I always think it's a really fun thing to retest certain workouts that you know are gonna be coming in the future to give your best on each and every day. And then just take the positives and the win from each session. So. If that was the rope climb and I got more than what I actually anticipated or I made shorter breaks, highlight those moments for yourself. Those are the victories and the wins that are gonna carry over to keep the momentum of training. Don't just beat yourself up, be mad or upset because it didn't go as planned. That's okay, it happens, but that's where you can head over to the water cooler, ask questions, find out more information from other people because you'll realize more people are experiencing those things than just you. So be sure to reach out to everybody, have fun, good luck in the eight weeks.